Hey, Crashers. Hope you had a nice spring break. I was bopping around the country and have landed back in Oregon to start this new series. We've dipped our toes in general world history and have done an in-depth examination of U.S. comics history, but now we're going to look across each of the great oceans to explore the histories of two of the other big traditions in this, our beloved form. We'll get started with what's probably a little bit more familiar to most American readers. That is manga, or Japanese comics. Oh, and in case you forgot, I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. Before we jump into the history proper, I want to take this video uh, and talk for a few minutes about those things that will help set up our discussion, provide some context and terminology, all that kind of good stuff. What is manga? What do you need to know before you get started? Well, let's start with that first question. What is manga? Manga means comics in Japanese, and it's composed of two kanji, more on that later, usually are translated to mean whimsical, sketched, um, lively pictures. Now, I use the word manga specifically to refer to comics made in Japan for a Japanese audience. I don't really gel with this idea of, say, American manga. For me, those are comics influenced by manga and made in the style of manga. There's actually a whole different Japanese word, komiksu, looks like this, and that can be used for all comics, just like the word manga can. But usually in Japanese, komiksu refers to US or European comics, while manga tends to refer to, well, comics made in Japan. So there are definitely different opinions when it comes to this whole non-Japanese made manga or original English manga or there's a lot of different names for it. And this isn't a strict moral code or anything, so there's room for disagreement. But here's why I draw the line where I do. People tend to have a big stereotype about what manga looks like. But the thing is, manga doesn't look like any one thing, just like American comics or European comics. There are certain trends and values, and the history of the form has led to a series of aesthetic values that are shared and commonly used tropes in the visual language. Despite those stereotypes, manga can come in a myriad of different visual styles, and some of which might not look like what you might think of manga at all. But they're still manga. That's why I get a little salty when people say that an artist who follows manga-like visual tropes is a manga artist, no matter how talented that artist is, because it limits an entire art form's history and visual language, one that is tied to a specific cultural, historical, political, and linguistic context, to a visual style, and often an exaggerated and stereotyped version of that style based on a relatively limited amount of exported texts. For example, in the US, we get almost no translations of alternative manga. Now, this is not to say that anything is wrong with being influenced by a style. Embrace it and utilize it. The name manga, or a manga artist who's not from Japan publishing in a Japanese context, just feels appropriative to me. Now, if an American artist was working with a Japanese publisher and publishing their comics in Japan, that to me would still be manga, and that does happen. There are non-Japanese artists publishing manga in Japan. Likewise, if an artist is working in a style influenced by manga, but making a comic with an American publisher written in English, something like, for example, Sana Takeda's work on Monstrous, to me that's not manga, that's an American comic. But, of course, her own visual style is hugely influenced by manga. Again, it's complicated and there are a lot of ways to read this, but for my purposes, when I talk about manga, I'm talking about comics published in and for a Japanese audience originally published in Japanese. Okay, manga is Japanese comics. Anime is a term which you will often hear paired with manga. Now, anime refers to animation. It's actually short for animation. In other words, anime and manga are not interchangeable terms. Though, many anime television series and movies are often based on popular manga series. So you'll have a Ranma one half TV series or an Attack on Titan TV series that is based on the Attack on Titan manga. One of the other things that you'll notice if you pick up almost any manga on the shelf these days, though not always, get to that in a handful of videos, is that they're backwards to westernize anyway. That's because traditional Japanese writing is written vertically and read from right to left, like this. 
However, Japanese can also be written horizontally and read from left to right. This is one of the reasons it can be a really tough language to learn, and we'll get to more reasons shortly. Manga reads in the traditional way, both across the page and within the panels. So you'll start with the panel on the top right corner and read from top to bottom and from right to left, something like this. So if you're getting into manga seriously, it can help to know a little bit about the Japanese writing system. Now, obviously, if you're reading it in translation, you won't be encountering this all the time, and you don't need to learn it by heart. But modern translations often include sound effects or other background details in the original language. Plus, there are often little details about titles and names that make a little more sense if you're aware of how Japanese writing works. So, one of the biggest doozies about learning Japanese is that it has three writing systems. Written Japanese is a syllabary. That means that its writing system is based on syllables rather than individual phonemes or letter sounds. And Japanese has about 70 syllables, and the most basic writing systems have a symbol for each syllable. The most basic system is called hiragana, and then there's also katakana. Now, they have symbols for the same sounds. The difference is that hiragana is usually what folks will learn first, and it tends to be used for uh, native words, whereas katakana is used almost exclusively for transcribing foreign words. So like when I said comics earlier, they're borrowing the English word comics into Japanese, so it's written in katakana, as well as things like onomatopoeia, more on that later. Now, if you're a linguist at all, the history of hiragana and katakana is super interesting, but it's a bit too much of a tangent even for my standards. So, we move to the third system, kanji. Kanji are Chinese characters that have been adapted for use in Japanese language. They're used to mark both the historical origins of words and to provide context to differentiate between identical sounding words. Now, in the abstract, that sounds a little confusing, so let me give you a concrete example. Mash the sounds ha and shi together to make the word hashi, pretty easy sounding word. The problem is it can make three different words. Hashi can mean bridge, edge, or chopsticks, depending on the context. But from a distance or in isolation, you might not know what each one is. So in addition to context, kanji can help a reader tell the words apart. Now, Japanese writers, including manga writers, like to take advantage of these homonyms as well as connect to older meanings of words. And lots of manga have these elaborate puns that play out in character names or place names. Uh, someone like Rumiko Takahashi does a lot with this. This might help you understand why some of these jokes getting, are getting made or some of these jokes don't seem to make sense. It's probably more important for the casual manga reader, instead of knowing some of these deep in-jokes, to be able to spot the difference between katakana and hiragana. So on the whole, hiragana is much more rounded and sort of flowing, and katakana has more straight lines and hard corners. You can see the examples here. Now, this is mostly used in onomatopoeia, uh, which if you don't know that word, it usually means sound effect. Things like bang or pow or boom, splash. Onomatopoeia is, plays a much bigger role in Japanese than it does in English. Um, sound effects make their way into everyday sayings, and there are sound effects for things that we tend not to have. Things like feelings, um, or things like saying that that's shiny, or that's dull. Now, katakana is usually used for exterior sound effects, sound effects of the world outside, while hiragana tends to be used for interior sound effects, feelings, and thoughts. There are lots of exceptions, uh, but that's a tendency, and there are tons of exceptions made for aesthetics. No even if you don't necessarily have these symbols memorized, you can get some sense of what you're looking at. Finally, and we'll talk about this as we go, there's a really interesting genre distinction in Japanese publishing. And it's essentially that uh, genre and gender are equivalent. While many genres exist, there are romance and sci-fi and sports and fantasy and whatever, Manga tends to be divided into girls' manga, which is called shoujo manga, and boys' manga, which is called shonen manga, as its primary distinction. 
there are tons of subsections like jose which means older girls manga seinen which means older boys manga and then subsections within that or or sort of offshoots things like gekiga which means dramatic pictures or adult manga not that kind of adult stop it but the overwhelming majority of manga is published by being sort of dumped into a gender bucket now readership is all over the place girls read shonen manga boys read shoujo manga and the stereotypes and norms associated with each of these kinds of categories are fuzzy and artists and authors cross lines all the time but nonetheless to this day the majority of the industry is constructed along pretty strict gendered binaries. Okay, I think that about covers it. We can get going. And next episode, we're going to start with history. I'm going to try and cram the pre-20th century into one episode. Not sure it'll happen, but bye gum, gum barimasu yo. Ja, mata ne.